All right, thank you and welcome to everyone to today's presentation of the Science Circle. I'm happy to see so many uh, eager faces here to learn about, in many ways, what is a bit of an esoteric topic, and that is historically, what did people think before uh, we considered evolution to be a Darwinian mechanism? But you know, what I hope to do, especially by the end, is to convince you that the relevance of understanding the history of a theory can help us understand both the criticisms or the invalid criticisms that you can sometimes face with them. So again, formally, I am Stephen Gazier. I am a former biology instructor, currently working in industry. And here is Stephen Zutfly to talk about updating Darwinian evolution, part three, uh, evolutionary theory before Darwin. And this is a part of a, a series, an ongoing series I have, where in the first two parts, I talked about the molecular biology, the genetics, the modern science updates to Darwinian theory. And then we talked in the second one about the idea of sexual selection and how that uh, uh, comes about, especially in the human mating game. And this time, uh, what I want to do is go back to before Darwin, because we do need to, I think, update, in some cases, this misconception or really mispresentation of how Darwin came about a theory. And so this next slide is kind of a, to some degree, a bit of a simplification of how in many common discussions, discourses, and to some degree, and even some textbooks, they portray the idea that really everyone believed in uh, special creation by a divine Christian creator. And again, this is more specific to the, the European um, geography. And that basically Darwin wrote this book and just changed everything. And now it's true, he changed everything in terms of the theory of, of evolution. But the idea that he basically went straight from thinking about the Bible to uh, coming up with this whole theory is, I think, a false and misleading one. And one reason why I think this is important to kind of update in terms of how we think about Darwin is that a lot of people like to focus on the personality of Darwin as a criticism to his evolutionary theory. And I think, again, I'll talk about that more at the end, that this is kind of nonsensical. But just to be sure to make the, the claim that without Darwin, we would still have something very akin to what we currently understand as evolutionary theory. So, uh, and this again, like in much of science, there were contributions that people were putting forth and then a theory was developing and there were cracks in the theory and one or two people came along with those things that helped explain it. So, Let's just have a quick update about the core representation of what Darwinian theory is. And that is just this basic idea that species, uh, again, some sort of organizational unit of creatures and organisms that we recognize as a breeding unit can vary within their characteristics or behaviors, any number of traits. And that that varies within the population and that some of them have an advantage for again survival or passing on their genes than others and that the reproductive capacity of any given species of organisms vastly outweighs um, or vastly can outpace the ability the carrying capacity of its environment and so there's always this competition and I think that was one thing I wanted to update that um, Darwin had in his, his second book that um, Mating selection is, of course, actually usually one of the most primary competi competitive forces with, for, an organ for an individual within a, within a species. You're always competing to be able to pass on your genes, at least in these like sexual mating um, species. And so his theory really rests upon the idea that the best reproducers, and this again has to do with fitness, it's not necessarily the strongest, but those that have the ability to pass on more genes uh, to another generation, can um, contribute more to the next generation, and that over time these favorable traits accumulate, 
And again, something that Darwin didn't specifically go into, but something we talk about now in modern biology, these barriers that allow a species to be one unit that's distinct from its ancestors and other, other um, you know, related species that had a common ancestor. And so um, his theory connected a lot of dots, and we'll come back to that in a little bit, but this is really understanding this mechanism of how speciation occurs. And that this is unique to the evolutionary theory at the time, to some degree, that he put these together in a way that just made a nice coherent sense. And then again, like any good scientific theory, had strong predictive powers. And it has stood the test of time for the most part. Okay. Um, let's talk, let's back up a little bit. Again, one thing I didn't want to do today was go back too far in history to talk about a lot of the things that say the Greeks um, believed or um, you know, go back far enough to the Aristotle way of describing species. But I do think there's this one core element that persisted up until Darwin's time and this idea of vitalism. And that is the idea that the reason living organisms are different than the rest of things that you see in the observable universe that are matter and energy is that they have this fundamental vital force something supernatural, metaphysical, spiritual, again, some call it the Elan, that basically drives what exactly they are. And that is, uh, again, a very metaphysical, supernatural way of describing what makes things different. And this is, again, something that persists. And again, one way of describing this would be from a Christian context, uh, the life force idea. So, and a lot of what connected vitalism to biology was the idea that whatever this life force was, this Elan was also its characteristics drove the characteristics of the organism and also drove its adaptation or evolution over time. And so um, one example I have here in the bottom right hand corner, anybody here fans of the Transformers? I think I think the age group for a lot of people here, that was something they enjoyed on Saturday mornings. Uh, a lot of the updated versions of the Transformers included this thing called the Spark or the All Spark. And if you've seen this, they really play this up in the most recent movies where there's this like energy force that animates and helps basically re, you know, drive all the transformers to be these living, well, you know, living sentient animated beings. And this idea I think is something that is a, a good way of like, thinking about an analogy to, well, no, I, okay. So George, the Energon cubes were actually just like food. I don't think they were distinctly the same as what were all sparks and all that. So, Anyway, this, this type of idea I think was a good example or analogy of that type of thing that people. Uh, one good example of this, and again, this is someone who's, you know, just a generation before um, uh, um, Darwin is like from uh, Friedrich Wolf, he talked about the homunculus. And again, this is something you might have seen in fantasy or science fiction terms, but the next page shows like the most common pictorial example of this is that the adult human form of having a brain, a head, two arms, two legs is actually pre-made, is pre-formed inside the sperm. And so that when a sperm then gets into uh, a female and that leads to the next generation, that that is, the, everything that happens is just building upon this template form in order to become the fully realized adult. And so this is uh, a concept that you see, again, very similar to this idea of a vital force that forms this and then it's the template for further development. Uh, now, is there any sort of creature or any sort of thing that, that happens or a term from biology that makes this on its face a somewhat nonsensical concept? And this is one thing I hope to do today is include a little bit of this thought experiment that we can all participate in for why some of these things don't make any sense, even at the time would not make sense. Any animals where having some sort of preformed body to describe its adult form is just completely nonsensical. Adrian points out frogs and butterflies. Um, and I think those are really pretty good examples that the idea that uh, metamorphosis is something that occurs uh, 
is kind of flies in the face of this idea of a preform thing. Um, yeah, um, Dave brings up kind of an interesting one that scientists used to think some, some very interesting things about fossils. Uh, Barragon sent me a YouTube video that some of the old shells of um, mollusks, some of them were called the devil's toe. And that uh, just, you know, people like to make up fantastical things to explain, again, what they can see at their face. And, I, and sorry, that was one thing I meant to mention a little bit earlier. Is that one thing to, to give, to, re, to, re, to re, be mindful of is that all the science up to this point was very philosophical and observational, right? The whole idea of the scientific method, uh, you know, Sir Francis Bacon type idea of progressing through science really did not exist. So to some degree, let's keep, keep in mind. And yeah, Katya mentions ontology recapitulates phylogeny something. We'll come back to a little bit later, actually, with the Von Baer work. Um, okay. Now, again, even before one comes up with the idea of how species came about and what sort of mechanism you'd have to explain that, you can, of course, catalog these. And so, uh, of course, you know, from early Greek times, we have documentation of how Aristotle decided to categorize uh, spe species and animals on the planet. Uh, but again, in terms of a more modern synthesis, John Ray made the case that really um, to understand how we understand species, we need to come up with these like key characteristics, type organisms, the idea of what is a species. Uh, again, the mechanistic idea, although to some degree, I'm sure some people were thinking of it even at the time, that obviously an elephant doesn't interbreed with a cat. You know, there's some aspects that people understood that they were isolated in terms of and Linnaeus, of course, is the father of taxonomy that um, while he was, again, most famous for having set up these categories and cataloging the wide variety of species that existed at the time. Uh, one thing I want to point out that was that in his own viewpoint and philosophy of science, they were all specially created, that there was, in fact, one individual um, pair or in the case of hermaphrodites, you only need one. So why make more than one? Just make one. That basically were there from some sort of beginning point and basically propagated forward through time. And so uh, in, in Linnaeus's viewpoint, species were also, for the large part, constant. And again, this is something that we now know as this uh, taxonomic classification that, again, even with, among modern science, there are lots of reasons that we are moving away from this once we understand more about DNA and can set up relationships with DNA, we still want to name things. And so this idea of the genus and species, but then also grouping things together within higher categories makes sense. Now at the time, again, let's face it, at the time, in terms of observational science, you want to say, you know, cats are related, dogs are related, dogs related to the wolf. Uh, these are both mammals. And so these classification systems set up. Now they were limited. You know, Linnaeus really only described mammals, although largely called quadrupeds, uh, birds, amphibians, which included reptiles, uh, the Pisces, insects, and then worms, the vermes. And so, uh, and you can imagine that if you're a European and trying to figure out what are the best categories that describe the vast majority of what we can see around, that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I have here some screen captures um, from, from Linnaeus's work. Uh, showing, again, both um, the, uh, the reptiles as well as the mollusks the vermi from the vermes group. And so um, I do want to point out one thing. So again, you can kind of see how these are categorized and they work together to make it look, you know, like you would categorize these, these things as a class. You're not even necessarily saying they're related in terms of any sort of biology or physiology, but they all resemble each other. And so they were, you know, you can group them in some sort of categorization. Now I do want to point out one thing, which we're going to come back to in just a second. When you think about at the time, people believed in increasing complexity and that these different groups, uh, are related and are especially or created in a sense to be increasing complexity towards man. Notice the top two organisms on the right and the left. So on the right in the vermes, a lower category, the uh, you know the worm 
resembles a lot in terms of morphology, the snakes or other salamanders that you might have on the left-hand side. And so this idea is something that also starts to uh, make some other theories, you know, contradictory. Uh, and so Kai mentioned something about a loop. I, I'm not really sure what you mean by a loop with cats and wild cats and lynx and lion. I'm not sure what sort of loop idea you mean, but maybe we can come back to that at the end. Especially when we talk about the donkeys and horses, which will be coming up. Uh, and then again, so this is common from, again, particularly in the Christian tradition, the idea of the, the ladder of life. This idea that there is this uh, increasing complexity. And that of course, the top part of it ends in man, that man is the highest expression of God's complexity. Or again, if there's some sort of nature driven force of vitalism, that man is at the top be the most complex and elegant. And again, same idea that again, specifically ordering these from lowest to highest, you have the ordering of the list you see here with the, at the base, you have the vermes, at the top, you have mammals and humans. Now, again, one thing I pointed out is if you do have this idea of increasing complexity, then why are some examples in amphibia very similar in complexity to the lowest rung on the ladder? Uh, so tagline mentions about whether the Greeks conceptualized a great chain of being as well. And that sounds familiar. I'm not, you know, my, uh, my historical readings of Greek biology don't go, aren't, aren't all that fresh. So let's talk about some of the predecessors before Darwin that, again, started to, again, from this basic building block uh, in terms of natural philosophy of, you know, things have vital forces and have always been the way they are and they're especially created. Where are the areas where this started to change? And so Buffon is one of the first ones, again, writing the you know history of nature that really formed this uh, basis for modern classi classification of organisms, which really started to group organisms in a way to say that they are, you know, related to each other in a more uh, observable way. One thing that people credit um, his works is that they're very understandable. That one thing he went for was having a nice readable way of describing science as compared to Linnaeus, who was just very, very dry. And one thing that he, he did, which is I think an important part is that he pointed out this continuity between species that you can see that they are gradations between them in, sin, in a sense that, you know, the horse is closely related to the ass. And that could that mean that there's some sort of relationship between them that is, that is you know, a, a, a mechanism of how they came about. Uh, again, it's very easy to um, uh, one should not necessarily invoke the idea that they were thinking biologically. But again, this, this is something that could have been designed. And he came up with this idea of the unity of type. And so this is just basically trying to clarify and organize this idea that when you think about uh, any given species being described categorically, that you have this the, the key features of it that are most important for understa understanding its its biology. Uh, and one thing that he also did that was a little bit different, so in the ladder of life, one thing we have is this idea that things are continually improving to a higher form, to be more like um, a higher level being. And he was actually one of the few people that argued for the degeneration of species, and in fact, if you have things like vestigial, well, again, I'm, I don't know about his particular arguments in some of these, but that when you look overall, you can, you can imagine that there are uh, a pinnacle of the species, but then there are you know, variants or versions of it or close related ones that just look less, less elegant. And that would actually potentially have been a degeneration version of the original species. He was also one of the first major scientists to incorporate the idea that the earth is very old. So one thing, um, anybody know, according to the Bishop Usher, in what year the world started? This is the, the, the term you'll hear quoted from Christians many times that the earth would start very close syzygy it's actually 4004 bc is typically the term yeah very good Mick. Vic, you got it 
Um, so yeah, about 6,000 years ago. And again, they calculate it based on, oh, if you believe the Bible is an authoritative source of history, and you count the number of generations going back that's in the Old Testament, you can come up with an argument for, you know, you can make up a year that the Earth was created. So, um, and that's the other thing too, is that he also, in terms of this idea of having a generation, you can also say that the scale of natura doesn't make sense. And so his categorization of species was not a matter of one being more you know, high, highly complex than the other. It's just the idea that they do group categorically differently. And so here are a couple of, uh, you know, illustrations from, from his work where, again, comparing the horse to the ass. And then uh, one thing that he, you know, I actually went through and read through the argument that uh, went through these pages, that he gives these, these very long descriptive versions of how elegant he thought the horse was, that the ass was, you know, not as elegant, but he did, but he still kept them as distinct species. He said, these are very distinct species. And one thing that we know from breeding a horse to an ass is that the, the combination of two is a mule, which again, looks somewhat intermediate between the two, very hardy, and yet cannot perpetuate itself. You cannot breed a mule with, again, the other gender is called a burrow, but you cannot breed those and get, get offspring. Actually, maybe you sometimes can very rarely, but they largely do not propagate. So again, that would make the argument that the horse and ass are in fact different species. And this idea of, and the one thing that I think you really have to stop and think about is this is actually a way of determining experimentally whether things are different species or not. And so this idea of maybe to some degree testing a hypothesis and saying, oh, you don't get offspring from this is a way of saying things are different species. Um, okay, but the one thing that I also think is a little bit contradictory is I was reading through through the work, he compares like the greyhound versus the shepherd dog. And what, you know, if you look at these two, they look way more different in many regards than the, the equine example. So where is it then in terms of observational descriptive science, do you say that these are more or less close. How does describing something tell you really something whether it is or is not a species? And I think maybe in his case, he would make the argument that these dogs can interbreed. So in fact, they do represent a species. All right. So uh, again, one of the next major luminaries in the field would be Buffon. And again, he wanted to write 50 volumes of his major work, but it only got through 36 before he passed away. And what his, one of his major contributions to, to the biology and evolution is the idea that um, epigenetics, and again, this is not the modern epi, I have it in quotes because people use the term epigenetics differently now, but that what are the characterizing and organizing forces of biological beings actually has to do with their like chemical composition and their organic particles. Now again, he was, um, this doesn't uh, fit and square with any sort of like particular theory today, but the actual idea that there are not, there's not some sort of supernatural metaphysical force that's driving the organization and the vitality of a being that actually comes from some sort of, you know, natural system of chemistry, I think is, you know, a very unique step forward. Because then once you start thinking about the idea of the chemistry of something, the physical aspects of a being driving what it does and how it reproduces and the why it's a species, means that you can start moving away from supernatural forces. And, and it, yeah, we'll be talking about creation and uh, cataclysm in just a little bit, Vic. Um, I think that, again, if we want to think about how old species are and how rapidly they can evolve and the ways that we know this from DNA, I would actually go back and refer you to updating Darwin part one. Um, and Barragon mentions embryology. And I'll, again, we'll have a brief mention of that as well. Um, sorry, I thought. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, let me go back. Let me say one last thing about Buffon is that, well, on the other hand, there was still, while well, he got away from the idea of the homunculus, okay, that this homunculus idea doesn't, doesn't really work and make any sense, he still had this idea, which again, a little bit vague in terms of science, was of an interior mold, that there is some still, still maybe some degree of organizing force that drives uh, 
the characteristics of any given species. Okay, so now if we go specifically to two generations before Darwin, and we know this because this was Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin was a physician, and he was, uh, again, quite literate, quite widely read. Uh, he put out a, a pamphlet called Zoomania, which is actually a pamphlet of like 1,200 pages. But again, a lot of it is a physiology textbook. And so as you read through it, he talks about circulatory system, diseases, um, the lymphatic system, these types of things. But uh, some of the widely quoted stuff that, that comes from him, that, that again, he didn't want to make any strong case that would get him in trouble culturally, but that he did make basically some claims about how evolution works. And this is the idea that warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, which the great first cause, again, this idea is still of supernatural creation, endured with animality, but had the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions, and associations, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity. And that he, that are capable of basically delivering these down to, to of their improvements by generation to its, or all posterity, again, world without end. That, again, he's actually, again, invoking this idea of variability within organisms in a species, the ability to uh, pass this on to the next generation, and that some, that there starts becoming an argument here that some are better than others, or more fit. Now again, and I have here this in the next slide, that some of the other quotes from, from that is that the strongest and most active animals should propagate the species, which should hence become improved. So this idea that, or some sort of, you know, um, again, this is survival of the fittest, or the survival of the strongest, is a mechanism by which some individuals survive over, over others. And again, just to not confuse the issue, Darwin talked about fitness in terms of number of offspring you can have, and whether they maintain an advantage from generation to generation. But um, this idea that there are some that are better than others and compete uh, is important. And that, again, he describes this idea that, again, the, what are the, the things that create the volitions of what species, what organisms want to do within a species has to do with uh, lust. So again, sexual mating, maybe to some degree, he's trying to describe hunger, and then also security. Again, one thing he doesn't mention is um, the desire to have offspring, but I think that that's a fairly good case for saying, here are some driving forces behind evolution and organisms. Uh, another um, luminary from the field. Again, this is someone who was more in the geology. And again, we'll talk, I'll give a little bit more of a summary of geology in just a second. But uh, James Hutton, and he uh, put out a large volume, Investigations of the Principles of Knowledge. Again, a lot of this is philosophical. I tried to read and find some good quotes and got lost in the 1800 pages of the PDF. But he did actually have a very important idea in terms of the principle of variation. And again, without reading the whole thing, the idea here is that uh, there are adaptations to an environment and that those provide advantages to that individual within a species and they can then, you know, pass that on to more individuals of their, of their race. Now, this principle of, of variation, of course, is um, one of the key founding ideas of what Darwin had. And so, you know, this idea was, again, between him and Erasmus, this idea of variation within species is not, is not new. But I do want to point out that in context, you know, he's still a creationist, and that the idea that um, the, the source of organisms was something other than special creation, and then maybe they can go and carry on and do things on their own, and then try and survive and pass on their genes, was still, um, again, he was a strict creationist. So, and this is actually a good time to have a little bit of a brief geology interlude, is that one thing to keep in mind is that when you think about Bishop Usher and a lot of the common idea of how we describe how old the earth was, again, uh, 6,000 years is not a lot of time. And so when you think about the idea that there even can be variation with the species, if you're still stuck with only 6,000 years with which to work, then how can you come up with any sort of evolutionary theory? And 
Yeah, so Kanye, you, know, you bring up an interesting point, and I will try and remind me at the end when we can come back to that. That um, what was happening within the field of geology was this idea that um, if you look at lava flows or or um, or volcanoes, or if you start looking at like cliffs where you have lots of degradation, or you start looking at what we now know as the boundary between tectonic plates, that you can actually see formations that indicate a lot of activity happens in the Earth. And so, again, a lot of people talk about how Darwin had a copy of Lyell's book about geology. Um, and Lyell, of course, was making this very kind of relatively unique argument that the geology of the Earth can change. And that was like to some simple idea, the idea that the geology can change is something that was, again, important for Darwin to incorporate into his thinking. Although interestingly, Hutton was one of the first people to really put uh, a timestamp on how old the Earth must be at over a mil at millions of years old, right? Now it's still off by, you know, a factor of a thousand times times four for how old it actually is. But um, again, the idea that there's millions at least starts gives you the ability to start thinking about evolutionary change over time. And here is a nice illustration from uh, Hutton's book. And he was not the illustrator. But this is, uh, from example, in I think the countryside where it actually had um, like a cliffside or maybe some sort of um, uh, construction that allowed you to actually see these geological strata. And so the idea that there might have been adapt changing things over time and thus layering on pieces of dirt and other stuff over a long period of time allowed this to suddenly make sense. And one thing that this really helped people do, so there's been some discussion in the chat that of course the old Greeks thought that fossils were remnants of you know the monsters from their mythology. But the idea that if you can start believing in the ancient earth, you can start making more sense of what these weird little bone formations are. Well, again, they're rocks, but they also look like bones of animals or shells. And so the idea that they may actually represent extinct species when it is something that can now start helping you incorporate how evolution and species and organisms can change over time. Okay, so um, Lamarck. So again, one of the few nods that you usually do get in textbooks before Darwin is, um, is talking about Lamarck. Again, as a way of contrasting what Darwin had to say. And I really dislike the way they put that a lot of times is because there's a lot more that Lamarck and Darwin, I would say, had in common as you look back on over time than really how many differences they had, primarily because of some of the mechanistic differences. Um, so in his major work, The Philosophy of Animals, um, he coined this term, this um, inheritance of acquired characteristics, which we now again typically refer to as Lamarckism. That, um, it really kind of represented this first cohesive theory of biological evolution. And what he had were two main parts, is the idea that there was an al alchemical complexifying force that drove organisms up a ladder of complexity. So again, kind of to some degree adhering to the idea of compared to older organisms or some sort of scale of natura, that there was something that drives you towards more complexity. But then also a second force that adapted them to local environments through the use and disuse of characteristics. And so here is, um, you know, one example of the most common example of this. Again, this was not in his, in his work. It was something by a contemporary. But that if you have a giraffe that has a potential food source in trees that, again, maybe other organisms can't take advantage of, then over generations, again, the giraffe can actually, in a sense, grow their neck. There's some sort of the environment is telling the giraffe, hey, this is useful for you. And then there's some sort of organizing force that says, hey, more complexity, more advan advan advantages out of being able to eat these leaves, and boom, you suddenly get this evolving force. That, um, and that this would explain, again, a lot of what you see in variation in nature, this, these perfectly adapted, these well-adapted creatures to the environment, the fact that they, um, do vary and that different species can evolve from some common types. Again, Lamarck was, again, still 
adhering to taxonomical classifications. But one thing that was actually very interesting about Lamarck is that he did have, he did propose some ideas of branching evolution. That the idea of these different categories that Linnaeus knew as just being some, being some sort of co-equal or each one representing an original type that then evolved over time was not true. And so if you look up here, uh, again, not in English, but on the right hand side, you can see the Burmese are something that gives rise to the insects. And that insects, even though these are largely land-based flying creatures, you can recognize a lot of similarities to spiders and crustaceans, even though um, the crustaceans live in the sea. And so this idea of having some sort of tree of life and this branching idea of one organism giving rise to another one, that means there must have been enough individuals that were different or adapting in a way to make them distinct, again, in this case, this whole different uh, phy uh, phyla, that this is something that, again, is a precedent to what Darwin ultimately proposed. Uh, again, one thing though, in terms of the origin of original species, uh, he did believe in spontaneous generation. Again, not something that was necessarily a vital force, not something that was supernatural, but that there was some degree of spontaneous generation that led to the original organisms. Okay, so again, kind of a contemporary to, to Lamarck, uh, it was Cuvier. Again, someone who also started from a geo geology background and then developed a distinct interest in uh, systematics and biology once he actually took over a professorship from a friend of his who died. And he wrote um, Essay on the Theory of the Earth. And he was someone who also, again, now that we had a better sense of the geology over time, he was one of the first people who made a big, a big case about the fossils in taxonomy are things that you can group and relate to species that exist today in terms of categorization. Now, um, what his theory of the origin of species and how the earth has developed over time were in periods of catastrophe, where essentially you'd have mass extinction events and then everything would be recreated every time. Uh, so for example, while he named the mastodon, the fact that the mastodon was extinct and you could say it's related to elephants of current time, they actually weren't evolved from one another. There was no relationship between the two, but that when they got recreated from one cataclysm to the next, you would see these same types come back together. Yeah, the abiogenesis is this idea that, again, from uh, what you call inorganic matter, you can have organic. And that this was a very extreme version of this where boom, you have this very rapid regeneration of, of whole, whole species and organisms. Uh, again, one thing to point out that his life, his context was he was a fierce anti-evolutionist. He was, <laughs> even though he proposed some very important things and helped contribute to these ideas, um, you know, that, uh, that was not his worldview in the end. Um, now, one thing that he did come up with, though, even though he wasn't saying that these were evolved, he did come up with this idea, especially, I think, because he was such a fossil specialist, of the principle of the correlation of parts. And this is something that broke from tradition where a lot of characteristics that were described within species by the taxonomist, these were all independent parts, right? That the teeth were different than the feet, that were different than the hair, and were different than the internal organs. And he's saying they are interrelated. And that the important essentials of some traits can tell you more about the rest of the animal. So again, if you, um, teeth, for example, that, again, if you look at any given species right now, you can, you can look at their teeth and get actually a very good sense of what their diet is. And if you start thinking about their diet being something that is very particular, say, to bamboo, then you start getting a sense of where they live. Maybe other adaptations that allowed them to, you know, eat, acquire um, bamboo, for example. And so this is something that, again, like there's a, the Denosovans are an example of a human, uh, or of a homo species that we really only know now we have its DNA, but we actually could tell a little bit because we found its tooth. So this is not like any sort of other um, ancestral human tooth. And then also he made this very important thing that is, again, in modern biology, and the evolutionary theory is very important. This, he distinguished the idea between homology, the identity of parts by descent, versus analogy, which is now something that we call conversion evolution. And so that, for example, bats and birds both have wings, but they're not from some sort of commonly descended part. And so I think um, 
Oh, actually, yeah, and Vic actually mentioned something else that's been in the news a lot lately, is that we actually take teeth, and we can laser ablate them, and actually look at the minerals and the different subcategories by mass spec, and actually learn a lot about the diet of species. You can also learn a lot by the plaque, the bacteria that are on the, the remnants of the, of the, the bacteria that were on them. It's amazing how much we can learn from teeth. And so I think this is something where, again, the genesis of this idea comes from Cuvier saying, look, you can look at these, and that this relates to the whole organism. But again, the point I want to make is that once you start thinking about organisms as these interconnected parts, then it makes very sense how mutations, or again, what Darwin would call monstrosities, can help the whole organism survive in a different way. Right? These, now the fact that they're not disconnected parts, that they are connected and important, that's where mutations and phenotype differences start becoming important for Darwin's theory. And again, uh, Cuvier, he was someone who reorganized the tecton tex taxonomy to talk about vertebrates, mollusks, articulates, and radiates. Again, something where, again, you look at the body type, and you can see how these body types are very important for the functionality, the way the organisms work. Again, vertebrate can tell you a whole lot. If you just had only the, sp the, the, the vertebrae of an organism, there's a whole lot you can learn about that, for example. Um, so again, but the idea that you may have common original body plans that then led to other species that make variations on that body plan, I think is something that when you think about Darwin's use of embryology and those ideas are very important. All right, um, I'll make a brief mention of someone who, um, kind of one of the smaller people here, but he was someone who I think initially influenced or immediately influenced Darwin. And I wanna make one point. So this is Franz Unger and his major work is Attempt of the History of the Plant World, which I gotta tell you, what sort of self-deprecating scientist are you? That it's not just the authoritative history of the plant world. You're gonna say it's an attempt. It's, it's the best I can do. It's what, what you all might enjoy. So I hope one day to write some sort of attempt book myself. Uh, one thing that he made the argument was that thallophytes, that these types of very basal al algae that um, gave rise to plants. Again, plants have always been thought of, again, they are fauna. They are their whole distinct thing that is not related to other organisms on the planet. Again, this is also around the time where a lot of microbiology is coming up. But the idea that algae, which again, are photosynthetic, and then you have these uh, kind of, they look like degenerate plants, the, thal the, the thallophytes, that those, the ferns type of species can give rise to all, like a degenerate fern can give rise to all plants was this really conceptually important idea that very unorganized, simplified organisms can over, again, millions of years, give rise to something highly complex and highly differentiated. So I think that that's something where, again, he doesn't get a lot of, a lot of play, but I think he's one that, uh, again, particularly Ernst Meyer said was important. Okay, now the last one uh, is not a scientist. He's actually more of a popularizer of science. He's a book publisher. And at some point, I'm not, I, I would like to know, um, I, I would love to see a biography of this, but why he decided as a publisher, and clearly a very observant, smart guy, decided to publish Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. And this is Robert Chambers. And again, this is just a lot of his observations. He wasn't a scientist, he wasn't productive, conducting experiments, he wasn't a member of the Royal Academy or anything, but he just was very observational. And one of the things that he came up with, and again, his book covers a lot of stuff, it covers a lot of geology, physics, everything, but he did come up with this one idea, this idea of the principle of progressive development, that fauna have evolved through time, and he, again, he was mentioning von Baer as well as, um, I think, Unger, that, that these are things that evolve, and that catastrophes are unnecessary to explain life, that when you look at this unity of body organization, that these are old ancient body plans that progressed, and that, um, and this is where phylogeny, uh, onto uh, phylogeny recapitulates ontology, that that embryonic development, again, something worked on by von Baer, reflects like older body types of organisms that then get, have modifications and adaptations. So again, I, Ontology recapitulates phylogeny is not exactly correct. It represents something different in terms of how evolution and development occur. But accepting that idea at the time um, is something that he was putting out. Now, what's important to realize is that The Vestiges was an incredibly popular book. It actually got a lot of people talking. 
And so um, it was uh, something that really put a lot of conversation into into the culture. Now, he was not a scientist. And as, as I've tried to read through some of this, I'm like, oh, man, that's science. That's not how I would describe it. That doesn't make any sense. So a lot of professional science, professionals in terms of scientists criticize his details and thoughts without necessarily recognizing he was proposing some very important big picture ideas. And so, yeah, like I have here, I can only imagine how much he would get savaged on his Twitter feed from, from scientists from, from that type of work. And again, that's something that you can't easily do is you can criticize the minor things with, while missing the big picture. And so this is an example of kind of both the good and the bad. He actually was showing some degree of these trees of life, these um, adaptations and phy phylogenetic relationships, uh, again, showing trees of life. But we actually look at the description of this. He's making the argument that humans, or again, any given classification of animals like the birds, there's going to be some sort of most organized version of it. It's like most elegant version. And there are going to be ones that are more degenerate from that. Again, he did believe in degeneration. And that they can, you can see how closely related they are to these different groups, but that you have the most elegant ones. So again, it's one of these ones where you know, there's the parts and the pieces are there where when we think about Darwin's tree of life and everyone, I show the picture, textbook all show the picture of his branching organization of, of species. Again, between, so for example, Chambers, Lamarck, these ideas, you know, were something that were already percolating and stewing in the, the scientific uh, literature. Okay, so to kind of summarize, you know, leading up to Darwin, and again, I'm not including like contemporaries like Mendel and Wallace and people who had important contributions to the final theory. I just want to make this more global hundred year idea of what was coming up to Darwin that he didn't have to say Garden of Eden doesn't make sense, right? He just had to come up with species. He did not, sorry, he did not have to come up with the idea that species are well adapted or that offspring are formed but can vary. And that when you think about all the species on the planet, they have relationships that actually may have evolved from one from each other or from or ancient organisms. And these old ancient organisms had the ability to again survive and adapt in a different world. So this concept and then also that existing species are related to dead species. This idea of uh, the mammoth being something related and something that is ancestral biologically sperm passed down from generation to generation um, is something that can explain the diversity of life on the planet now. And you do not need supernatural metaphysical forces in order to explain it. Although again, I, I don't want to dismiss the idea. Of course, cataclysms can represent very strong stresses on organisms. And so this is not the only way, but one thing I'm also not talking about is uh, Thomas Malthus, who of course had this theory that humans were in big trouble because we would propagate and our population would increase faster than our ultimate agricultural capacity, give it enough time. And again, technically that is true. And so, um, and that of course, if you have food constrictions, then fewer people have to survive, or sorry, you're gonna have fewer people survive and then there's more intense competition among people, which again, also decreases the population. You know, think Mad Max type of, of worldview either the Mel Gibson or the, or the reboot. And so, but I think one thing that this did help contribute to, to, to Darwin's thinking is that the idea that you have changes in environment that can be a strong pressure, you can't have very strong competition within a species is something that can accelerate and makes more sense how those variants within a group can actually have that survival advantage. And so before I go to my last slide, I just wanna just kind of point out that what I think we have here is this, what's important to think about in terms of Darwin and his place and time, is that he helped contribute immensely to how evolution is thought about and helped put it into context and make sense by incorporating, uh, again, a lot of pieces of evidence. And if you ever read On the Origin of Species, I feel like I'm one of the few biologists who's read it, um, well, multiple times, but even just once, that if you walk through his arguments and the way he describes stuff, it's very powerful and very, very, convincing and well-written. And a lot of what he had to spend time on rhetorically was saying that certain things in, you know, theology 
do not make sense. And if he could have gotten away from having to spend all the time on that, I think we could have even had a better, better book. Um, and so, you know, one thing that kind of drives, that drove me crazy a few years ago was when Stephen Meyer from the uh, Design Institute, or sorry, Discovery Institute, that pr is a proponent of intelligent design, he came up with this book called Darwin's Doubt. And he wanted to make this argument that, oh, Darwin didn't necessarily believe in all this stuff. And he, had, he said, oh, maybe divine creator, or oh, I don't know, I don't want to say too much about this. Like, you know, that's nonsense. And that, one, science doesn't really care too much about what individual scientists believed beyond what they put into the scientific literature. And it's also, you know, let's face it, 150 years old, what Darwin's doubts may or may not have been for his theory at the time. But that also, if we're, you get this opening to, if we, we, if we try to put scientists too much on a pedestal, we give people who want to create controversy, who want to make good sounding rhetorical arguments, even though they're very weak logically, an opening to, um, to criticize the theory based on the, on the people who are involved with it. And so that's one thing I would just want to point out here is that even absent Darwin, you know, within this time frame of by the early 1900s, there would have been some form of evolutionary theory. Again, Wallace, maybe not, because Wallace, while he is considered a competitor to Darwin, was not very good at understanding the mechanisms of natural selection. And he also himself was actually still a devout theist. So there may have been aspects where we would have had different thing if we didn't have Darwin. And one thing I, I think what's worthwhile to really think about in terms of Darwin's main contribution to evolutionary theory is the idea that's very similar to what happened with the, with the work of Watson and Crick. That people were trying to come up with um, how DNA is structured. And again, someone actually just mentioned Paul Ehrlich, I think about population stuff, but he actually, um, sort of, I think had high ideas for how DNA was structured. Um, but when Watson and Crick came up with their model for how DNA works, this is the structure. Again, the structure was not known. But then as you looked at the structure, it created this very clarifying way to understand how DNA replication occurs. And again, how DNA gets replicated is, an important, is a very important thing in terms of cell biology. And so the fact that the structure gave insight into the mechanism of replication, and that replication mechanism was very elegant, made even more sense to help support the idea that the structure had to be correct. And so I think this is something where when you think about Darwin's contribution is that the way he described both natural selection as well as the inheritance and variability is something that made just ev made everything click for everyone to understand all of the important biology that was helping contribute to the understanding of the diversity of species on the planet. And so I think that's where I will end my talk. And thank you for your attention and listening. There's been some comments in the chat, which I may have missed. But I will take, again, kind of formal questions now and then remind me if there's something you want addressed from earlier. So thank you all for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Do I have a bow? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming. It's, I'm, I'm so much a molecular biologist and bench scientist, but I, of course, do enjoy the philosophical aspects and historical aspects of this, too. So I have a question from George Newberry. Am I familiar with the town in Poland that has only had female babies for the past two years? I am not. I hope there are some scientists looking into that or... Um, because that sounds interesting. I can imagine that there are mechanisms for how you will have biases that can crop up, of course, in genders. Yeah, so Aurora talks about the Garden of Eden being kind of a touchstone of, you know, Western philosophy. And that's one thing to point out is that, again, I don't really know a lot about other major... Um, cultures, theories about evolution or how that impacted Darwin. But it's not very clear that Darwin would have read much of their literature. 
So Synergy asks the question, do these pre-Darwinists help explain how our understanding of biology evolved? And yeah, it, that's a little bit of a pretty wide open question. I mean, in terms of, I think the point I was trying to make at the end, the idea that um, how maybe scientists understand and maybe the Thomas Kuhn idea of how a, a theory finally gets accepted is that, you know, what's really, I find very interesting is a lot of them, if they could have given up this adherence to a supernatural understanding of the world, they could have come up with much more elegant theories that would have explained the natural world better. You know, so I think this idea of how the personality or the philosophy of a scientist influences what they can and can't do in science is important. Um, in terms of other theories, again, Thomas Kuhn does talk about Darwinism and evolution as a part of his, the structure of scientific revolutions. And I think we can sit back and look at how, you know, to me, like many other theories, a lot of the pieces and parts were out there and you just needed someone to kind of push aside the veil to get to that final thing that wraps it together nicely and that makes powerful predictions. That's one thing that, you know, Lamarckism wasn't great at making predictions. And in fact, Lysenko, who was this uh, scientist and developed this whole idea of agriculture based on Lamarckism for the Soviet, or for Soviet, uh, well, ancient Russia, really kind of messed up the agriculture, right? And so, you know, this, that's how theories evolve. I think there's some lessons you can learn from that. Yeah, the evolution of evolution is kind of what it is. Um, okay, so this Polish town, Aurora mentions, has a population of 300 and only 12 births in 10 years. Yeah, you know, binomial distribution can get you all girl births. Again, uh, but there actually are other mechanisms. I actually just had this discussion in lunch the other day talking about what are the things that influence the gender of offspring. And there are environmental factors that could do that. Again, if you think about how the microbiota of the female genitalia can influence acid alkaline levels. These are things that actually you can see things that would ba give you a baseline that's not 50-50. Yeah, Barragon kind of mentions this idea, um, that the idea of paradigm shifts, which was a term coined by Thomas Kuhn, um, created this weird popularizing, I think, ways of misconceptualizing um, advances in science. I mean, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. I think the idea that we've tried to think of Darwin as this complete revolution of evolution, sorry, the complete revolution of evolutionary theory has kind of given us, you know, a false view in context of what it really was. I mean, if you really sat down and said, you know, tons of people believed in evolution before Darwin, they just had it slightly off in the details. That's a very different argument than, um, no one believed in evolution and Darwin came up with it, right? These very different ways of thinking. Oh, thank you. Right. Well, yeah, we do like paradigm shifts, Aurora. And I think it does make for a good story. And that's something that I think popularizers of science and the news media like to do now is really talk about the characters and the people involved. And that's can be very annoying. Um, again, Kuhn was really trying to more in a very staid sense, just give descriptive characteristics of what a revolution was. So I wouldn't, you know, something that people have taken and ran with in different ways. Vic, I'm glad you came. So tagline asks a question that I'm not sure, again, I fully understand. It says, when do you think humans perceived that their own existence arose from bisexual reproduction? Oh, like the idea that having sex led to babies. Uh, again, it's one of these things that you have to imagine is completely and very obvious from the very early days. Um, you know, as much as we're aware of things, I think it's very clear that, yeah, in prehistory, we think, even go back, you know, tens of millions of years ago, and you have probably relatively important cognitive developments in what would really be primate ancestors. You know, they had some degree of cognition of the pecking order of the alpha male versus sub, 
you know, the non-alpha males that, you know, would compete and you have to sneak around. Again, lots of the times the non-alpha males could reproduce by sneaking around from the alpha male, right? So some of that is instinctual, some of that is coded, I don't know, but the idea, you know, it, it's, it's funny that you can go backwards in thought that maybe there are other things that happen like storks, you know. Yeah, jinx, Mike, <laughs> you know. People sometimes do like to tell convenient stories. Yeah, it's hard to, I mean, maybe to answer the question tagline, I don't know when people came up with formal theories of how sperm propagated things to the next generation. And, um, but one thing that Darwin did have is he had these things, oh, what were they called, granules or granulites or something. They, he was trying to propose mechanisms of how this occurred. And again, the idea that people were examining under the microscope, the sperm, trying to think, oh, do I see a homunculus in there or not? Clearly, oh, uh, Max, Max has it right. Gemules, gemules. Thank you, Max. So, well, yeah, I think, you know, if you, if you look back in even like ancient civilizations, you can see attempts at making condoms. You can find these in as historical artifacts. So they were made out of things like lamb skin or other species animals. Okay. All right, any, any more questions? Okay, so here's kind of maybe a philosophical question from Ariane. And that, do you think if Darwin were to still be alive, would he win the Nobel Prize alone or together with other people I mentioned? That is actually kind of an interesting question. Um, one, you know, the categories of Nobel Prizes doesn't really include evolution. There's physiology and medicine or chemistry, which is where a lot of biologists get their stuff. But let's just say there was some sort of equivalent like Lasker Prize or bio biology prize. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, think, I think if you were to take him and they would find maybe one or two people who were like Lamarck. It, I, I could imagine, given how well-read Lamarck was at the time, that you could imagine it would be Lamarck and and. And, and Darwin, and then probably as like the third prize would be Mendel, who helped explain the mechanism. Again, that would be the type of way I would organize the three pillars of the important people working. Yeah, Katya, didn't you have a question earlier in the um, chat that was, yeah, you know, Mendel, Mendel's a great story. Uh, there's actually a really good, the History Channel was doing this series called Biographies, and they did a really good Mendel biography, if you can find that online somewhere. Oh, okay, sorry, a little discussion about fertility idols, but I think I'll, I'll just pass on that one in terms of that conversation. Yeah, the individual. All right. Well, anyway, if um, if there really aren't any more questions, again, I will be doing more Darwin updates. Maybe one day I'll do a summary lecture just to, to do that. Um, anyway, I'm gonna close off voice here real quick. I'll stick around maybe for a little bit for a little bit of chat, but otherwise, gonna head out. And uh, thank you all again for coming. Uh, if you have people who you think might be interested in this, remember that things will get posted to YouTube. Look for announcements from Science Circle from Chantal. Chantal, thanks again for hosting. All right, have a good day, everyone.